good afternoon, everyone. Just over a week ago, Albertans voted on a clear question. Should Section 36.2 of the Constitution Act 1982, Parliament and the Government of Canada's commitment to the principle of making equalization payments, be removed from the Constitution? Today, we have heard the results. A clear majority, 62% of Albertans have rejected the fundamentally unfair equalization program. In other words, 62% of Albertans are demanding a fair deal in the Canadian Federation. It received majority support in virtually every region of the province, in large urban centres, in mid-sized cities, and in small rural communities. Later today, I will be tabling a motion in the Legislative Assembly to ratify these results, which, if passed, will formally initiate an, a, a constitutional amendment negotiation. This is based on the very clear language of the Supreme Court of Canada in its 1998 secession reference, in which the Supreme Court said that uh, the constitutional right of each participant in the Federation to initiate constitutional change must be recognized, and that this right implies a reciprocal duty on the other participants to engage in discussions to address any legitimate initiative to change the constitutional order. Albertans are and always have been proud Canadians. In many ways, I believe Albertans are big Canadians, generous Canadians. And in many ways, Alberta is the most Canadian of the 10 provinces because of the huge migration to this province from across the country, from Newfoundland to British Columbia, hundreds of thousands uh, of Canadians have come to Alberta to work hard and to pursue opportunity, to be part of our opportunity society. And Albertans are proud to have played a major role in Canadian prosperity, to have shared so much of our good fortune and hard work and the, be the benefit of our natural resource wealth with other parts of Canada when times have been good here but bad elsewhere. In fact, Alberta taxpayers, through their federal taxes, have contributed over $630 billion net more to the rest of the country than they received back in federal benefits and transfers since the mid-1960s. $200 billion more in net contributions made by Alberta taxpayers to Ottawa in the last decade alone. Even while we were going through a period of deep economic adversity, the recession that began in 2015, Albertans continued to make a net contribution to the Federation in the range of $20 billion a year. And again, Albertans have always been proud to share much of their good fortune with the rest of the country. But all we have asked for, and what we are saying with these referendum results, is that we must have a fair deal. If Ottawa and our fellow provinces want to benefit from the hard work and the resources of Albertans, then Ottawa must allow us to develop those resources, to grow our economy. Instead, what we have faced is an endless series of discriminatory legislation and policies that have impeded Alberta's economy, undermined our, our constitutional authority, uh, including our ownership and control of our own natural resources. And all of this has resulted in tens of thousands of lost jobs, of dreams dashed, of uh, people moving from prosperity in too, some, too many cases to despair. Today's results speak clearly about that frustration. Federal uh, laws and policies that have singled out Alberta, like for example, the tanker ban, the first time in Canadian history that the government of Canada has specified one product to be banned from ec for export a product that is only produced in Alberta. Uh, th th a clear and direct attack on our economic interests. Bill C-69, the so-called new Federal Environmental Assessment Act, we call it the No More Pipelines Law, a clear violation of Alberta's exclusive constitutional authority under Section 92A of the Constitution. A critical win by Premier Peter Lougheed, a th recognition that in each province, the legislature may exclusively make laws in relation to exploration for non-renewable resources in the province, uh, 
a, a critic, uh, without which Alberta would not have ratified the 1982 Constitution Act. And yet that essential power, so critically important for our prosperity, is under direct attack from Ottawa. The Trudeau government's killing of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. They're killing effectively through regulation of the Energy East Pipeline project. Their abject surrender to uh, the presidential veto of the Keystone XL Pipeline. Watching other provinces now being given effective vetoes over uh, interprovincial pipelines while importing energy from overseas. Uh, other provinces banning development of natural resources and thereby uh, benefiting under the current unfair equalization formula. While Albertans contribute typically $20 billion a year, are the government of Quebec receiving $13 billion a year in equalization payments while uh, expressing a, def a political veto over oil and gas pipelines and refusing to develop its own resources. These are just some of the aspects of unfairness that have caused Albertans for so many years to demand basic respect uh, and, and to demonstrate a respect not only for our economic aspirations, but for the Constitution of Canada. And so uh, this is a powerful statement today, a democratic statement where Albertans are demanding to be respected. They're demanding that the jurisdiction of this province under the Canadian Constitution be respected and demanding that we be able to develop this economy and responsibly develop our resources so that, yes, the rest of Canada can continue uh, to benefit from Alberta's future prosperity. So later uh, today, I will be tabling, as I say, a motion in the legislature uh, to ratify these referendum results uh, and to initiate the amendment process. And we fully uh, expect the Prime Minister to respect the constitutional amendment process and to sit down and negotiate with Alberta in good faith. Of course, our focus ultimately, as I say, is a fair deal. A broader reform of uh, the fe system of fiscal federalism, a uh, retroactive lifting of the fiscal stabilization program cap to recognize the huge adversity that Alberta has faced in recent years, uh, the repeal or substantial amendment of the no more pipelines law, the repeal of the discriminatory tanker ban, which targets this province alone, and so much more. In addition, uh, of course, yesterday, uh, sorry, today, we are releasing the results from Elections Alberta on the referendum held on uh, the proposal to uh, maintain uh, daylight savings time throughout the year. And I understand the results were 50.1% voting no, 49.9% voting yes. And so uh, I, we thank everybody who came to express their opinion on that issue. Um, we will, of course, respect uh, the outcome and not pursue this matter uh, any further. The context here, of course, is that uh, all of our neighboring jurisdictions, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Yukon, uh, the north uh, western U.S. states are all moving in the process of moving to year-round daylight savings time. And we thought it was important to consult Albertans on whether they wanted to uh, follow suit. Uh, it's it's uh, as close as it gets to a tie, I think, with about a 2,500 vote difference. But we respect certainly uh, the majority in, in that uh, referendum. And finally, I'd like to congratulate uh, Pam Davidson, Erica Baroudis, and Michaelo Martignoc on their uh, election as Alberta's Senate nominees. Uh, this is a, an important renewal of Alberta's longstanding tradition of Senate democracy. Uh, this was the fourth election for Alberta Senate nominees uh, held since uh, the late 1980s uh, when uh, the government of uh, Premier, then Premier Getty uh, oversaw the first Senate election. Of course, we've had five of those selected or elected uh, nominees go on to serve in Canada's upper chamber, uh, having been appointed by uh, previous prime ministers, uh, including uh, Senator Scott Tannis, who continues very capably to represent Alberta. There are two uh, vacant Alberta seats in the Senate. And so I will be introducing a motion in the legislature later today, uh, calling on the prime minister to respect the basic principle of democracy and to fill those two seats with senators 
uh, Senate nominees selected by Albertans in last week's election. These individuals received, uh, respectively, 382,000 votes, 358,000 votes, and 237,000 votes. These are enormous Democratic mandates. There is uh, a convention of uh, prime ministers respecting Alberta Senate democracy, and this shouldn't be, con this shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't be controversial to simply respect democracy. So we'll be recommending that, um, further to a conversation I had with the Prime Minister uh, in July, we'll be recommending uh, to Ms. Davidson, Ms. Brudis, and Mr. Martin York that they uh, apply through the Federal uh, Senate Appointment Advisory Council, but really th th that should be uh, simply a technical process there should be these people, uh, the top two vote getters should be automatically appointed uh, to the vacant Alberta Senate seats so that Alberta will have strong democratically elected voices uh, in the upper chamber of Canada's parliament. So with that, I'm happy uh, to take your questions. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna go uh, to the phones first because we, we have uh, so many people in line today. So we just are gonna take three calls before finishing with all you folks who showed up in person. Uh, operator, can you please put through our first caller? Thank you, Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good afternoon, Premier. Um, I don't mean to rain on your parade today, but uh, we have this vote where a little over six out of 10 Albertans vote, voted yes, smaller amount, still a yes in Calgary, slightly smaller, and of course Edmonton's vote was, uh, was smaller still. I've been hearing this, I'm an old guy now, and I've been hearing this bluster from Alberta since I first was interested in politics in the 70s. So, um, yes, you could have negotiations. Yes, you could pass something in the Legislative Assembly. But how real is this? How powerful is this? Um, uh, th these moves. What, uh, what, are, what are you going to do if, uh, if they say, no, you've got a, a long list of grievances you want addressed? I mean, what, what, is, what is your approach going to be if you're still talking this way a year from now? Or you're, you've, you've been talking about this stuff for a while, and as I say, it's been going on for decades. So why are you convinced this time that somehow Ottawa is going to smarten up? Well, Rick, this referendum was always about creating political facts and creating legal facts. The federal government, in our view, clearly has a, an obligation to take this seriously, negotiate with us. If they want to respect the uh, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada from 1988 on constitutional amendments. Now, uh, in that respect, a referendum is, in our view, uh, necessary but not sufficient. We also need a uh, motion of the legislature, and that's why I'll be tabling uh, that motion later today. It'll be debated on by Alberta's elected representatives, uh, and I expect uh, it will be duly passed, and that initiates the process uh, for negotiations. So this creates a very powerful fact. In the past, yes, Albertans have expressed frustration, but we've now uh, given that, given Albertans an opportunity to express that in a formal, a democratic way, to speak powerfully uh, to Ottawa about our demands for fairness in the Federation. So um, we uh, call on the federal government simply to demonstrate respect for the uh, con principle for, of democracy, uh, the process for constitutional amendments, but more importantly, to demonstrate resp respect to this province that has done so much in making an oversized contribution to Canadian prosperity. That's what Albertans are saying. I hear them loud and clear, and I certainly hope that the Prime Minister does as well. And Rick, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, I do, thank you. Um, yeah, well, hope, uh, you know, Hope is one thing, the reality may end up well being another. Uh, again, you have um, your list that you listed off from, you know, the, the, what you used to call the equalization rebate, changing that, maybe big changes to equalization, big changes to legislation. Uh, what makes you think that this is not going to be yet another time where Albertans have been called to rally to the flag, so to speak, provincial flag, and will again 
be disappointed and thus actually perhaps even create more of that storied alienation that already exists. I mean, what are you prepared to do if you go there with all your legal stuff in hand and you are basically told to pound salt or something quite similar? Well, Rick, a couple of points. I, I don't share your kind of extreme pessimism. Alberta has been, Albertans have been uh, creative in advancing uh, their uh, demand for greater democracy, for example, in, in Canada. I'll give you the example of the Senate election process. When the Getty government brought in the Senate election process in the late 1980s, it was uh, ridiculed. The, all of the, uh, the so-called clever people uh, mocked and derided the idea, but it resulted in, for the first time in Canadian history, democratically chosen people being appointed to the Senate of Canada. It didn't happen all at once, uh, but it established an important democratic precedent. So uh, I, th that was uh, the government of Alberta uh, in the late 1980s creating facts that ultimately Ottawa responded to, and that's what we are doing here. Um, and so uh, this is a powerful statement of the, uh, I think, completely justified demand of Albertans to be treated uh, fairly in this federation. Uh, again, the fundamental principle we are articulating is this. If the rest of Canada wants to be partners in prosperity with us, great. But please, let us actually develop our economy and the resources that we own uh, as Albertans in a responsible way. Um, so uh, that's the message that we are sending. We uh, hope and expect that it will be uh, heard uh, seri and taken seriously uh, by the national government. The prime minister's uh, primary obligation uh, must be to maintain uh, national unity and to listen to Canadians in every corner of the country. And Albertans are speaking very loudly today in that respect. Thank you. Operator, can you please connect our next caller? James Keller, Globe and Mail. Hi, Premier. Um, in the Supreme Court of Canada decision you like to reference, there's a, a lot of discussion about the, a clear majority on a clear question. Um, on the issue of the clear question, you know, the referendum question here was about removing equalization from the Constitution. But you've made it clear that that's not really what the province wants. We want negotiations on other issues, uh, updated equalization formula, changes to fiscal fiscal stabilization and so on. Does that undercut your case when the question that was on the ballot wasn't even actually what you're seeking in terms of actual changes? Uh, well, actually, I, I would point to paragraph 153 of the Quebec secession reference, James, which says that it will be for the political actors to determine what constitutes a clear majority on a clear question in the circumstances under which a future referendum vote may be taken. We, this is clearly at 62%, a clear majority. It was a clear question, uh, and we expect it to be taken very seriously. Now, I know that there are some who contend that the Quebec secession reference uh, is limited in its application to referendums on secession, um, but I would point you to, I think, a thoughtful paper by uh, University of Calgary uh, Professor Emeritus Reiner Knopp, who uh, points out that uh, the province can still very clearly, uh, despite that view, uh, trigger a uh, negotiations over a constitutional amendment through a motion through the legislature. So that's why we're moving forward with that, if you will, for greater clarity. Okay, James, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, and w will the motion be specifically on that issue of removing equalization from the Constitution? Because, again, I'm just curious about, you know, you essentially said that that's not what Alberta wants. We want other things, but we're using this as, you know, leverage, as you call it. So I'm just wondering what the point of having a referendum question, having a motion in the legislature that very explicitly calls for this change to remove equalization from the Constitution when, you know, the public position of the government is that's actually not even what we're interested in. Well, uh, our, our position is we uh, are realistic in, in recognizing that there, this likely won't, would not achieve 750, but that doesn't prevent us from initiating negotiations with the federal government. And I would hope and expect that they would respond by acknowledging uh, the need to address a, f a fundamental unfairness in the whole system of federal transfers of fiscal federalism, including the fiscal stabilization program, but also the res respect. You know, we're not, a, in one, res one respect, we're just looking for the federal government to acknowledge uh, 
our control over our resources under Section 92A of the Constitution, something that we are uh, addressing simultaneously in our um, judicial reference to the Alberta Court of Appeals on that issue. So there are a lot of issues here that together constitute Alberta's uh, demand for fairness in the Federation, but one powerfully important aspect of that is equalization because it is through that that we make, in part, very large contributions to the rest of the country. Thank you. Operator, can you please put through our last caller we have time for today? Andrew Lawton, True North. Good afternoon, Premier. Obviously, the legal case has been made by uh, federal scholars and yourself that the federal government should have a, a duty to negotiate in good faith here. But well, what's the next step if that doesn't result in the kind of change you need from the federal government? How far are you prepared to go? Well, you know, first of all, we've just released this result today. The Albertans voted on this last week. And uh, so the legislature now will uh, debate a motion effectively to ratify the democratic choice of Albertans. Uh, then we'll forward that uh, to the Prime Minister. Um, and of course, I'll also formally make my uh, fellow Premiers aware of uh, the, the referendum result and its implications. Um, we will uh, make the strongest case we possibly can for reform and for fairness for Alberta and the Federation with this powerful democratic endorsement. Uh, and uh, uh, we will at the same time continue to pursue other aspects of our fair deal agenda, uh, including uh, building a stronger and more resilient uh, province, uh, exercising more powers under the Constitution, Later this week, we'll be, for example, releasing uh, the initial study conducted by the Department of Justice and Solicitor General on the cost benefits and potential uh, advantages of a Alberta Provincial Police Force. Uh, we continue at our Treasury Board and Finance Ministry uh, carefully to study uh, the potential uh, benefits of an Alberta pension plan, which, which I think would be E enormous given the big demographic advantage, the age advantage of Alberta for the past uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, we have continued, we just appointed an Alberta Chief Firearms Officer last month to have uh, more common sense oversight on the application of federal firearms legislation. We have created the Alberta uh, Parole Board uh, to have Albertans uh, making common sense decisions over parole applications for provincial uh, inmates. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we, so in, uh, we continue to pursue the broader uh, fair deal agenda uh, while at the same time uh, expecting a, the, the government of Canada to take this uh, referendum result very seriously. And Andrew, do you have a follow-up today? I do. Obviously, as, as you're well aware, the mayor-elect of Calgary has decided to make her first order of business as mayor to declare a climate emergency. She's also made comments that have uh, raised uh, some alarm bells for people in the energy sector, talking about moving past oil and gas. As premier, I know you want to work with the mayor and, and work with all of the uh, newly elected representatives of last week's elections, but what's your response to comments like that? Well, in a city that has been suffering from near double digit un unemployment uh, that has gone through five years of deep economic adversity. I find that a peculiar priority. Uh, I would have thought that uh, the mayor of Calgary's top priority would be getting Calgarians back to work. That's certainly my top priority. Okay, that wraps us up for the phone today. We're gonna jump over to the floors here. Just a reminder to everyone in line to please state your name uh, as well as the outlet you're with. Um, and I see Janet French at the start here, so you can go right ahead. Did, did you say Senator Thibault? I, I misheard that, I'm sorry. Uh, m f m we have a technical failure. Okay. Hello, okay, Janet French from yeah. CBC News. So today the Prime Minister appointed Stephen Gilbo to become Minister of the Environment and Climate Change as you know, he was the founder, one of the founders of Equiterre, which is cited in the Allen Inquiry report as a participant in anti-Alberta uh, energy campaigns. So what message do you think that his appointment sends to Alberta? A very problematic one. Uh, we have sought since the election, uh, since our election in 2019, to find a way forward with the government of Canada uh, that would uh, address the urgent need to reduce 
greenhouse gas emissions, uh, while at the same time growing our economy and responsibly developing our resources. And despite our best efforts, uh, we have constantly been uh, surprised uh, by ever more ambitious federal targets and prejudicial policies which seem to be directed at impeding Alberta's natural resource development, jobs, and our economy. And yet we still had a, I would say, a constructive working relationship with uh, Minister Wilkinson, um, who I think understood that Alberta is a good faith partner in addressing the climate challenge. Um, and I think broadly agreed with our effort and that of the energy industry significantly to reduce emissions through uh, investments in game-changing technologies, like for example, hydrogen, uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, um, and uh, also uh, the importance of, of Canada playing a constructive role in reducing global emissions through things like liquefied natural gas exports. Um, so I certainly hope that uh, the new minister, Minister Gibo, uh, will quickly demonstrate uh, to Alberta and other resource producing provinces uh, a desire to work together constructively on practical solutions that don't end up killing hundreds of thousands of jobs. But um, his own personal background and track record on these issues uh, suggests somebody who is uh, uh, more of an absolutist uh, than a pragmatist when it comes to finding uh, solutions. So I, I hope um, I hope that I'm wrong about that. I hope that uh, uh, I, I should say uh, I congratulate all all of the new appointees to the federal cabinet on their appointments, and and we of course will alert. We work with any elected government. We try to do that constructively. But I think, given Mr. Gibo's background, it's important for him to send a signal that uh, he doesn't see the government of Canada as an, as a uh, special interest group to impose uh, a radical agenda that would lead to mass unemployment. I hope that he will send a signal that he's willing to work constructively and cooperatively with us as partners in uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions while growing the economy. Do you have a follow-up today? Yeah, this is about daylight savings time, so I'm not sure if the Premier wants to address it or Minister Glubish or both would be oh, ideal. Sorry. Hi, Nate. <laughs> hey, he's here. Um, what now? So, so it's been very slim result, obviously, slim margin uh, between the result. But given that, like you just mentioned, other jurisdictions are looking at changing their clocks, potentially, you know, if they all kind of cumulatively decide they will. And, uh, and Alberta um, has now committed itself to this binding question, or potentially binding. What does it actually bind us to do? And what are, is Alberta going to do? if other jurisdictions do go ahead? Uh, it's a good question, Janet. Um, so first of all, what we've said from the start is that we would uh, respect the outcome of the referendum. And while it was close, it still is a majority in favor of not proceeding uh, with locking our clocks on daylight saving time year round. Uh, I know from the work we've done on this over the last couple of years, we've heard from many Albertans, you know, starting in November of 2019 on our, our first survey on this, where over 140,000 Albertans voted overwhelmingly in favor of locking the clocks, uh, all the way up and until now with this referendum. We know that folks feel very strongly about this. Now, there are folks who feel strongly that they would prefer daylight time, folks who feel strongly they would prefer standard time, and then there are folks who feel strongly that they would prefer the status quo and to continue changing their clocks. Uh, what matters, though, is that a majority of Albertans spoke and said, we're going to stick with the status quo. The government of Alberta will respect that decision. Uh, and you know, we will continue to monitor what other jurisdictions do. But for now, our priority uh, will be to continue working on leading through the pandemic, growing and diversifying our economy, and uh, positioning all Albertans for a strong future. I have a question for the Premier. Graham Thompson, High Politics. I have a question actually on today's topic, believe it or not, as opposed to me going off <laughs> on my own. Um, Do you want to talk about carbon capture? Uh, 
Well, we could, but <laughs> let's do that afterwards. Um, sir, on the, uh, the vote on the, the, the equalization referendum, you got 62%. Um, Pretty low turnout, about 38% roughly turnouts, about 24% of eligible voters. You go back to 2015, that election, 60% turnout, actually 57.1, I think. And the NDP won 40% of that, about 24%. But you called the NDP an accidental government when they got 24% of total eligible voters, but yet you're calling it a clear mandate when you got 24% total eligible voters on the referendum on equalization. So which is it? So, uh, Graham, th this was held concurrent with the municipal election, and you know full well that um, there, 38 percent is actually relatively high uh, for a municipal election. I suspect that the, the referendum on the ballot brought more people out than would normally come to vote uh, on municipal election day. I think that's a positive thing for democracy. Um, we could have scheduled this concurrent with, let's say, the next provincial election would have had undoubtedly higher turnout. Um, of course, federal elections have higher turnout yet. So I think this is just a reflection of uh, the kind of election uh, day that it was. We obviously wanted to hold this concurrent with a, a regular election uh, for ease of administration, save money on, on the uh, costs, et cetera. Um, so I'm very, very happy with this result. 62, I, I gotta say, uh, I'm surprised that you would be questioning the, the validity of a 62% mandate. It's very strong. And, uh, and Graham, I think you can see uh, in the public opinion polling that, uh, in, in fact, if anything, if anything, um, I suspect the, the yes number would have been higher in a higher turnout election. As you know, if you go to the federal election recently, um, the uh, federal conservatives won over 90% of the seats in the province. So. I think uh, the higher turnout uh, in Alberta elections tends to result in, frankly, more conservative voters showing up or probably more likely to support a referendum like this. But all of that's hypothetical. All of that's, uh, uh, you know, the political scientists can have fun with that analysis. At the end of the day, 62% is a very powerful mandate. Graham, do you have a follow-up to that? I certainly do. Um, on a question, actually, James Keller asked us to follow up. The Prime Minister was asked about the referendum um, a few days ago, like last week or so. Um, and he said that, um, dealing with the question, constitutional related question, that the Premier of Alberta should be talking to their pre other Premiers. So if th the question is the question dealing with the Constitution, then you need to have you know, 750, the um, seven provinces, you know, all this half the, half the population. So you should be talking to other provinces if you really want to scrap equalization. Now, you said that's not your intent, but when you go to Ottawa, you know, the Prime Minister is saying, yes, this is the question that was asked. So, yes, you can argue that 62% of the total population in Alberta agrees with that. But yet, the question you asked isn't why you're here. You're here for a different reason. So, our, to be absolutely clear, we are expecting, we believe that the, the law requires negotiations over this matter. And we will state the position of Alberta as expressed in the referendum. Uh, if the federal government... Uh, comes back and says that they're uh, unwilling to, to put forward a constitutional amendment uh, in the federal parliament, then uh, we will move forward with our broader demand for change to fiscal federalism, to federal transfers, the fiscal stabilization program in particular, proposed uh, changes to the equalization formula, but also to roll back other discriminatory policies that have had a devastating impact on Alberta's economy. So. We begin the process uh, of this constitutional amendment, and uh, if we don't have a willing partner on the other side, then we will move to these other demands that constitute uh, Alberta's fight for a fair deal. Dan Grumman with CTV News Edmonton for the Premier. Uh, when you forward this ratified motion to the Prime Minister, is there a time frame that you expect to hear back? I guess I'm asking, how long will it take for Albertans to learn whether this equalization referendum did anything? I don't have a specific time frame on that, and I don't think it's, it's helpful to uh, create artificial deadlines, but obviously we would expect uh, uh, the federal government to respond in, in a reasonable period of time. Um, this is a government that has just uh, appointed its cabinet today uh, that will be, I guess, reconvening the House of Commons at the end of November. 
Uh, so we understand that it's a government that's getting uh, re restarted right now. Uh, so I wouldn't expect an immediate and formal response, uh, but um, we, we will uh, convey this as a matter of urgency to the Government of Canada, um, and uh, just as we do with respect to the appointment of the two vacant uh, Senate seats. And Dan, do you have a follow-up today? For Minister Glubish, if I could, on daylight saving time. So Minister, the, uh, the survey that you referenced, the 2019 one, found 91% of Albertans were in favour of scrapping the time change. Two years later, it's 49%. Many experts leading up to this election said Alberta should move to permanent standard time, and you alluded to that uh, based on its geographic position, uh, mainly to avoid the long, dark mornings in the winter. Um, we talked about how other jurisdictions are moving to daylight saving time, permanent DST, because of their geographic position. But based on where we're located, should you maybe have worded the question differently? Well, first, um, as you know, a referendum question needs to be a clear yes-no question. And so, and it, and it can't be two questions. So we can't say, do you want to lock the clocks, yes, no. Do you want daylight or uh, standard time, uh, yes, uh, or neither or. Um, so we, in our assessment, had determined that given that the vast majority of provinces and, and uh, states in, in, were moving towards permanent daylight time, uh, and given that it would be important that we not move in an opposite direction and being completely out of sync with all of our trading partners uh, and, and the rest of the continent, uh, that the choice should be between the status quo of changing our clocks twice a year or locking the clocks on permanent daylight time. And uh, as we saw from the results, it was very close. Uh, the, the vote c came in as, as no, we're going to stick with the status quo. We will respect that, uh, that outcome. Okay, we have time for about two more questions today. You can go ahead. Thank you. My uh, question's for the Premier. Premier, it's Brianna Karsten-Smith with Global Edmonton. I wanted to follow up on Graham's question um, about the turnout. You call it majority of Albertans spoke uh, that the 38% uh, is actually a high, relatively high turnout and that you believe the referendum actually brought people out. We're actually seeing a pretty large number of either blank ballots or um, uh, spoiled ballots. Uh, for the Senate, it's uh, 400,000 ballots that were not counted. It's tens of thousands of ballots that weren't counted for the two uh, referendum questions. So again, I'm going to ask, how can you call this a clear mandate when uh, a very small portion of Albertans voted and had their votes counted? Well, uh, over a million Albertans voted. That's not a small portion. That's, uh, uh, you know, in a... Uh, We've had provincial elections before with, with turnout as, as low as about 42%. So this is in, in, in that range. This is high for municipal election turnout. And I, I just read news coverage last week that, for example, the, the, the new mayor of Calgary won in a landslide victory. She got fewer votes than the yes side did in the referendum. So uh, if, you know, we recognize that, that mayors and councillors have a clear democratic mandate on similar turnout results um, with winning with 35 or 40 percent of the vote, then I can't understand why we would doubt the legitimacy of a 62 percent plus vote where you've got over a million people voting. So um, I, I think that, uh, again, if, if this were held on, let's say, concurrent with the federal election, you would have much higher turnout, and I suspect also a much higher yes vote based on the, the the kind of nature of the of the extra voters who come out um, at, at higher turnout elections. Brianna, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, just speaking with other premiers, uh, I'm wondering if you have spoken with other premiers when it comes to this equalization issue that you're going to be taking to Ottawa. Have you had any support in finding those seven numbers? Who do you think you would find support from? Well, a question was asked when I was on a panel with premiers uh, a few months ago here uh, doing a, a virtual news conference. and. Premier Mo expressed support. Other premiers have not. Okay, we can go ahead with our last question of the day. Hi, Mirna Dukic for Radio Canada. Uh, Monsieur le Premier ministre, pour revenir sur la péréquation et le taux de participation, vous dites que c'est un bon taux de participation pour les élections municipales, mais ce n'est pas pour un référendum. Je suis sûre que vous savez que le référendum de 95 avait un taux de participation de 93 quelque chose comme ça. Alors, encore une fois, qu'est-ce qui vous fait dire que vous avez un mandat assez fort pour convaincre Ottawa? Écoute, je dirais que 62 est une majorité claire 
euh, c'est une expression puissante de volonté des Albertains pour justice euh, dans la Fédération canadienne, euh, y compris euh, en ce qui concerne la question de péréquation. Euh, on, euh, on a eu le vote euh, avec les élections municipales euh, pour être plus efficace et typiquement, nous voyons un taux de participation dans les élections municipales en Alberta d'environ 30-35 Alors, je dirais que c'était une augmentation par rapport le, le, résultat, le résultat typique. Et si vous voyez les sondages, qui sont évidemment informels, mais si vous voyez les sondages sur la question de péréquation, le nombre des Albertains qui veulent une réforme est, au, est, est encore plus large que 62 Alors, je crois que c'est clair, absolument clair, qu'il y a une volonté démocratique ici qui doit être respectée par toi. And uh, you can go ahead with your follow-up. Et pour revenir sur la nomination de Steven Guilbeau, en 2019, vous aviez tweeté que vous pensiez que c'était l'équivalent québécois de Tepora Bergman, que vous pensiez qu'il allait tuer l'économie pétrolière et des centaines de milliers d'emplois. Est-ce que vous pensez encore cela de lui? Et si oui, qu'est-ce que vous pensez que ça veut dire pour l'économie albertaine? Écoutez, euh, si M. Guilbeau suit euh, les politiques euh, qu'il appuyait en tant que militant euh, auparavant, ça serait un désastre pour l'économie canadienne. J'espère, par contre, qu'il va démontrer euh, une approche euh, constructive et raisonnable pour travailler avec l'Alberta euh, et les autres provinces, l'industrie de ressources naturelles, euh, pour euh, euh, faire le progrès important sur la diminution des, des émissions de gaz à effet de serre, mais de le faire d'une façon qui permette la croissance économique et les emplois. Et ça, c'est pour M. Guibault à démontrer, je dirais, la bonne foi, parce que évidemment, il a un bilan personnel. Euh, je dirais, assez extrême en ce qui concerne ces questions-là. Et je crois que, que les Canadiens veulent, euh, au plan national, être une approche sur la, la politique du climat sérieux, mais ils veulent une économie prospère et ils, ils ne veulent pas les politiques qui euh, ferment la porte d'une façon destructive sur la les, les, les plus large industrie au Canada qui est l'industrie énergétique. Maybe I'll, I'll say that in, in English. I was asked about Mr. Uh, Gibo and some comments I've made about his views in the past. Um, if uh, the government, if the policy of the Canadian government becomes the positions that Mr. Gibo advocated as a uh, special interest activist, that would be devastating for the national economy and particularly for the country's largest industry our energy sector. Uh, and so I very much hope uh, that he will demonstrate uh, a far more practical and cooperative and respectful approach uh, towards uh, the 800,000 Alberta Canadians who work in the energy industry uh, and demonstrate a cooperative approach to reduce uh, in a significant way greenhouse gas emissions while also facilitating economic growth and job creation. And if that's uh, his focus and the focus of the federal government, we're willing to work with that. But if, uh, if this signals uh, a, an, a, a, an even more hostile and aggressive posture from the government of Canada, uh, we would uh, obviously fight that to defend Alberta jobs with every tool at our disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you.